Thanks again. And if a couple of postdocs would stay and, and help out with the changing of chairs. Thanks. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ITC Colloquium this semester. Today we have a great honor of hosting two local great speakers from both BHI and actually CFA. So we would have start with Fabio that is actually talking about searching for a potentially missing population of lens quasars. Quite interesting. Few words about Fabio. Fabio received his PhD about two years ago from actually from Italy, from a school on Normale Superiore. And then he moved to Yale University for three years. And now we have him actually for like a joint fellowship between BHI and Clay fellowship. So with that note, let's start with his actually talk first. Yep. Thank you, Razi, for the introduction. The, work, the mic is working, I guess, right? OK. So yes, good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here to our talks. Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, the search for a potentially missing population of uh, lens, the high redshift quasars, or redshift higher than 6, or as we sometimes call them, uh, about phantom quasars, for the reasons that you will see in uh, just a few moments. So this is a general outline of my talk. I will start with a very brief historical overview on lens quasars. Then I will uh, discuss about two observations. The first one is the detection that we did last year about uh, the first strongly lensed quasar at redshift higher than 6, so inside the realization epoch. And the second one is the claim about a very famous quasar that I will mention uh, just in a few slides that could be maybe magnified by a factor 450, so a really, really astonishing factor. And uh, of course, I will drive some uh, theoretical implications about both observations. So to start this talk, I thought it would be interesting to mention the first occurrence of the words lens quasar on the ADS in 1971. And this was the paper. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to these words on the, the abstract, which say that quasars are not novel constituents of the universe, but merely bright compact objects, which have been focused and have had their brightness intensified by a galaxy situated along the line of sight, acting as a gravitational lens. So in 1971, they thought that quasars are uh, not really supermassive black holes, but they are just bright, compact objects. And uh, they are so luminous just because they are uh, um, gravitationally lensed. Uh, the discovery of the first lens quasar came in 1979 with uh, this object at redshift 1.4 by Walsh and uh, collaborators. And then many other quasars were discovered after that. And at the beginning of the year 2000, for instance, with this paper by Whitey and Loeb, people started to realize that uh, due to the very high lensing optical depth at high redshift, it's quite likely that uh, quasars at redshift higher than 6 could be magnified by significant factors. And uh, in particular, in this paper, they say that uh, up to one third of quasars at redshift uh, about 6 should be magnified by a magnification factor higher than 10. So quite an important number. So this was the farthest lensed quasar at redshift uh, lower than 6 uh, until a few months uh, ago. It was a redshift 4.8 uh, with uh, uh, it's strongly lensed but with a magnification factor uh, uh, not very significant. And last year, 2019, uh, the group of Xiaoyi Fan also contributed to some observation, detected this beautiful uh, source. This is a quasar at redshift 6.5, so well inside uh, the realization period, and uh, with a total magnification factor of about 51, so very, very strongly lensed. This is uh, the model that I will describe a bit more deeper in uh, just a few slides. The redshift is a redshift, uh, the, um, the quasar is a redshift 6.5, and the lens galaxy is uh, about uh, redshift 0 0.7, so much closer to us, of course. So this was the preliminary observation that uh, Xiaoyi Fan uh, did, and in part with the, the LBT, so a ground-based observation. And uh, you can see that uh, the source appears uh, unresolved. You can't really see that uh, there is a structure inside there, apart maybe from some asymmetry here on the left, on the left part, on this part, as you can see here. But you can't really say anything from there. 
Uh, but what you can see from uh, the first uh, images is that it was an ultra-luminous quasar. Actually, this source was the brightest source ever found in, in the universe to date. So that's why uh, we were interested to this source. These are the apparent properties of the quasar. This is uh, the quasar that I'm talking about, the red star. So in this plot, you can see the, the inferred black hole mass here on the horizontal axis is about 5 billion solar masses. Here on the vertical axis, you can see the bolometric luminosity, 3 in, 30, in uh, 10 to the 48, so it's extremely bright. And uh, here, you can see other famous quasars, and uh, in particular, towards the end of my talk, I will also talk about this very famous quasar. Uh, gray points with uh, contours here are lower redshift quasar from the Sloan uh, survey. And it's also interesting to mention these lines here, the dashed blue line, that indicate the fractions of Eddington uh, luminosity. So as you can see, this quasar is apparently uh, accreting strongly super Eddington. So it's a very peculiar object for many reasons. So this is the spectrum that we took with the Keck telescope and instead of focusing on the very nice features that you can see here I want to draw your attention to this part of the spectrum actually so shorter than the Lyman alpha and uh, let's zoom in to this part and uh, that's the, the Gunn Peterson trough of course you don't expect life, light from the quasar in uh, this region because it's absorbed by the neutral hydrogen between us and the quasar so here you can see some IGM spikes that are not relevant for what we are talking about. But here, in the deepest part of the Gunn Peterson trough, you can see some weak continuum uh, emission that shouldn't be there because the, the, the optical depth of those redshift is very, very large. So um, this is what drove uh, the attention, especially of uh, Xiaoyi Fan and his uh, group. They requested an HST image, and this is what they got. This, you can see some uh, structure, substructure in the, in the source. Especially, you can see something that seems to be detached here that we labeled as G because you will see that it's a lens galaxy, or at least what you can see of the lens galaxy. And here, the main source is actually appears to be uh, bimodal, meaning uh, uh, two different, at least two different uh, sources. So how can we say that this could be the lens uh, galaxy? You can see just a few pixels there, right? Well, um, let's go back to the spectrum. This, I, I told you this is the deepest part of the Gunn Peterson trough. So if you put a, a filter here, just taking the light uh, coming from that region of the spectrum, you don't expect light from the quasar at all. You expect only um, light coming from sources that are closer to us, so after the reionization happens. So this is what happens. This is the, the HST image. And this is the HST image with the filter on the deepest part of the Gunn Peterson trough. So let's do it again. You see, um, the, the quasar completely disappears, and in the same position that I showed you before, there seems to be still some light coming up. So the best fit model was uh, for a galaxy, for our source at redshift 6.5. This is a very precise measurement, actually. And uh, the uh, redshift of the galaxy is about 0 0.7. It's a photometric redshift, so it's not very, very accurate. This is the best fit model, the fiducial model. The galaxy is here. And uh, actually, the model predicts three different sources, but we can see only two, because two of them are uh, sub-resolution with the HST. As I said, the, the source has a magnification factor of 51, and the maximum separation, so the maximum separation between this and uh, the, the bottom uh, source, is about 0.2 arc sec. Yes? Fabio, what is the uncertainty on that 51? Uh, it's very low. It's very low, especially now. In the first paper, it was uh, about uh, 10, I would say. But now we have new ALMA measurements about the same quasar, and uh, the, the, the accuracy of the, the, the magnification factor is actually confirmed. It's about 50, 51. So I would say with new measurements, it's about 1, 2, uh, in uncertainty. Are you going to describe your contribution? No, not, not here, because, uh, yeah. yes, because it, they're not published yet. Yeah. So, and um, as I was saying, this is the, the separation between the top and the bottom one is 0.2 arc second. It's just above the HST resolution. That's why we can barely see them. And the lens galaxy is also interesting because it has a stellar mass of, 
almost 10 to the 10 solar mass. So it's a very small galaxy. Actually, it's the smallest lens galaxy that uh, we've found so far. So what are the intrinsic properties of the quasar now? Because uh, I told you this quasar is magnified by a factor 51. So if we decrease the luminosity and consequently the, the inferred uh, mass, you see that the quasar goes into the kind of normal distribution of high redshift quasar, so it's not as weird as before, and uh, the mass is about 500 million solar masses. So starting from this observation, uh, we did some uh, theoretical calculations. In particular, we developed a lens probability model in order to ask questions like, how likely is to have this uh, high magnification at redshift? Yes? How do you get the black hole? What? Oh, it's, um, it's from the from lines, uh, and actually, you see, you saw here that uh, when I, um, the shift is not exactly, uh, it's, it's not exactly one to one, because uh, the mass scales as the square root of uh, the luminosity at a particular band, I, I think it's 1450. So the luminosity scales linearly with uh, the factor 51, and the mass decreases with the square root of factor 51. That's why you don't see an exactly one-to-one -one scaling there. So it's a, it's a photometric measurement of the mass with a, a line that I don't remember at the moment. So, um, as I was saying, uh, we developed a lens improbability model uh, to ask questions like uh, how likely is it to have this quasar and how many uh, more of them we expect from surveys. So I will fill out this plot progressively. Here you have the, um, the log of the magnification factor. On the vertical axis you have the probability of having a magnification factor higher than a given uh, um, than a given value. This is our quasar with a magnification factor of 51. And since was, this was the first and only quasar out of 150 at high redshift found to be lensed, this is the observed frequency of lensed uh, quasars at redshifts uh, at redshift higher than six. Now, we developed uh, our model uh, and we used the quasar luminosity function model that has double power law. And uh, the main parameter of our model is uh, the slope of the bright end of the quasar luminosity function that we label as beta. There is a minus, so it's always positive. So I'm um, considering uh, a beta of 2.8, so quite a shallow value, but very common in literature. This is the distribution of lensing probabilities that uh, you get, and in particular, the probability of strong lensing, so the probability of uh, magnification factor higher than two, is about 4%. Uh, percent. Instead, if you go to steeper values of the quasar luminosity function, for instance, uh, 3.6, you get that the probabilities are higher, and the probability of strong lensing is about 20%. Now, why does this matter? The only point that we want to make with this plot is that independently on the parameter beta that we use, but still with reasonable values of beta, we expect many more uh, lens the quasars uh, in the eight redshift uh, at redshift higher than six than the only one that we discovered so far, especially at magnification factor lower than uh, 10. So this is what we call phantom quasars because they are quasars, lensed quasars that should be there at redshift higher than six, but we can't see them for some reasons. So why can't we see them? Celifan proposed a selection bias that is a very, very interesting explanation and uh, I will describe it visually in uh, the next slide. And an additional factor could be related to the fact that the separation between images is unresolved, meaning that uh, you maybe are um, acknowledging the fact that a source is a quasar, then you observe it with the HST, and you can't see two images, and then you say, well, it's just a normal quasar, it's not a lens quasar. So what's, the, what's about the misclassification of lens? The, yes? Yes, but we do observe very bright objects. So you just say, okay, this quasar is very bright, but it's bright because it's intrinsically bright, it's not lensed, right? So uh, what's, what's about the misclassification of lensed uh, quasars? Let's uh, say this visually. So 
this is a quasar, assume that this is a quasar, and uh, you're studying this source with uh, a photometric uh, survey. So this is your photometric aperture. In order to detect and to acknowledge that this source is a quasar, you need to observe basically no light or a very low flux of light in the dropout bands, so just short for of the Lyman alpha. Now, the problem is, uh, if you have a lens galaxy in between you, uh, yourself, and uh, the, the quasar, what happens is that uh, the galaxy can introduce some uh, contamination flux in the dropout uh, bands. So your uh, uh, selection criterion for a quasar is fooled by the presence of uh, the galaxy in between yourself and the quasar uh, as well. So for this, this quasar, the quasar that we discovered at Redshift 6.5, we were very lucky because uh, uh, the source is very, very magnified, has a magnification factor of 51. So the light coming from the quasar, let's say from the Lyman alpha here, is very, very, um, is much more uh, intense than the, the light coming from the contamination of the lens galaxy over there. But uh, if we were just a little more unlucky, meaning that uh, the magnification factor was a bit, uh, a bit lower, you see, this is a simulation, of course, the light from the quasar and the light from the galaxy would have become comparable with each other. So also this quasar, if it was just slightly uh, with a lower magnification, wouldn't have been selected as a quasar at all. So this is why uh, Xerifan proposed that many high redshift lens quasars are likely misclassified into low redshift galaxies because the, the, the selection criteria is fooled by this effect. An, addition, uh, an additional problem is that uh, the separation between the images could be unresolved. So this plot uh, uh, reports on the horizontal axis the separation of two images in arc second and this is the cumulative probability of a fraction of sources with uh, separations higher than a particular value here in the horizontal axis. And as you can see, we predict that about 15% of the sources should have a separation between the two components that is lower than the, the HST resolution, 0.1 arc second. So maybe a source, as I was saying before, is uh, recognized as a quasar, but not as a lensed quasar. So one solution to this problem could be W-first, and uh, W-first has a resolution that is similar to the one of uh, the HST, but uh, it will uh, uh, survey a much larger fraction of uh, the sky, and maybe can uh, resolve many of uh, these questions and uh, act as a ghostbuster to find uh, our uh, lens uh, phantom quasars. So we can ask how many phantoms, how many phantom quasars are uh, out there? On this plot, I report on the horizontal axis the probability of strong lensing, so the probability calculated uh, from our model of getting a uh, um, magnification factor higher than two. And uh, this is the, frag the ratio between undetected and detected quasars at redshift higher than six. So, for instance, uh, a, num um, a ratio of 100 means that uh, the phantom quasar population is uh, 100 times larger in number than uh, the detected population of, uh, of uh, normal quasars. So, if you, uh, just to give some numbers, if you take uh, a number density of one uh, quasar per gigaparsec uh, cube at, re at this redshift, which is reasonable, uh, using uh, shallow values of the quasar luminosity function, which I labeled uh, here just for convenience, uh, this is 2.8, you see that the correction is pretty small, it's about a 3% correction, so it wouldn't be very important for the, for the composition of the high redshift universe. The fact is that if you go to steeper values of the quasar luminosity function, given also to very large values, and this one was proposed by Kulkarni uh, last year, so it's not so impossible to achieve, um, you get that the, the correction between very, becomes very large. So for this value in particular, we have a, an additional contribution that is 12 times larger than the actual discovered population of quasars. So depending on the intrinsic value of the quasar luminosity function, this can become very important. So until uh, a few months ago, I concluded this talk usually with uh, this question. What, what if the brightest high redshift quasars are lensed? 
So, you know, we have a problem at, uh, in, the, in the Redshift universe. We have the detection of uh, quasars, very bright quasars already at Redshift 7.5. This is the, the, the farthest one. These are accreting supermassive black holes on the 10 to the 9 solar mass scale. And in order to form these sources, you need to start from black hole seeds at much higher redshift. These are formed around redshift 20 or 30, and depending on the seeding model, they can have an initial mass of 100 up to 10 to the 5 solar masses. Now, the problem is uh, the, between the, the time between the formation of the black hole seeds and uh, the detection of these sources, the time is very short. It's about uh, alpha billion year. So we don't really know how, uh, I, I mean, it's very challenging to, film, to, to form these sources. But many people um, before us also proposed that uh, these sources, at least a fraction of them, could be lensed, meaning that uh, you're observing uh, uh, a brightness that is much higher than the, one, the, the intrinsic one, so the mass should be also rescaled down, and that could uh, make uh, the, the challenge much easier to, to, over, to overcome. Well, uh, you remember I showed you this uh, uh, plot a few minutes ago. This was our quasar. There is another quasar here that is a bit odd, and this is, was, this is the most massive quasar at high redshift ever found. Of course, uh, in science, being saying that something is odd doesn't mean that it's not real. It can be just like it is, you know? But uh, a few months ago, there was a very bold claim came out on archive about this quasar. And uh, this quasar is uh, the Vu et al. 2015 with a 12 billion solar masses. It's a very, very massive quasar. So this, um, uh, as far as I know, it's still uh, submitted to APJ. I don't know if it was accepted. Just, okay, perfect. Oh, perfect. Yes, so it was accepted on uh, APJ. So this... Um, this, um, these investigators are, um, are proposing that this quasar is uh, magnified by a magnification factor of 450. So it's a very, very significant magnification factor. And how do they reach this number? Why do they believe that uh, it's the case? Well, first of all, they get some dust continuum maps from HALMA. And as you can see, they seem to be seeing four different uh, peaks. They're very clear in their paper. They say it's possible that uh, it's just different star formation regions. But what if it's actually a multiple image of the same uh, quasar? The problem is that uh, they don't see uh, multiple images uh, in the HST uh, detection, so in the, in the optical uh, part. And this is how they explain that. So this is the source plane. This is the image plane. Um, um, the red ones are the ALMA emission regions and uh, the blue one, the HST emission region. And they assume that they are separated by a small offset, about 50 parsec, which on a galaxy is not that much. So they say that uh, the uh, HST emission region is on the caustic of, uh, in the source plane, so that in the image plane, uh, the three images and the fourth image here, especially the three images here, are on the critical line, so they are extremely magnified by a factor of 450. Instead, the fourth image is, uh, uh, is very extremely faint, and it's not visible with the HST. These three images are visible with the HST, but they are too close to each other. They are about 0.05 arc seconds, so they are just sub-resolution to the, to the HST. Instead, these, three, these four crosses are uh, the ALMA peaks that they actually observe in the dust continuum uh, maps. So this is their model. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, claim. We can't say that it's true or not. We need more uh, observations probably. But uh, with Avi, we asked, uh, is the claim reasonable? How can we say if uh, we, can, we can make a, a consistency check on this? So we did this. And uh, this is the uh, being the observed uh, quasar luminosity function from uh, Jiang 2016 using 55 uh, quasars from the Sloan uh, survey. And uh, this is our quasar, the one that is supposed to be magnified. So what we did is the following. We assume that uh, it's true. This quasar is magnified by 450. And with our lensing model, we compute how many fainter quasars we uh, lensed, that are lensed, we expect from the same distribution. 
So as you can see, using shallow values of the quasar luminosity function, 2.7 and 3.2, we are already predicting more lensed quasars than uh, the total number of quasars that we are observing at different, different magnitude bins. And the correction for phantom quasars uh, with uh, these values of the quasar luminosity function is very minimal. So this is not possible. We, we are predicting more lensed quasar than the total distribution of quasars that we already have. Instead, going to steeper values of the quasar luminosity function, 3.7 and 4.2, you see that the, num the expected number of lensed quasars is compatible with the, the observed distribution that uh, we have. So uh, is the claim reasonable? Could be. Uh, it's, it's unlikely, but could be reasonable. I mean, it's reasonable given that uh, uh, it puts very strong constraint on the bright end of the quasar luminosity function, which needs to be steeper than 3.7. And I'm talking about the intrinsic value of the quasar luminosity function. So just to conclude, another couple of minutes, uh, we also drew some uh, implications if the claiming is confirmed, of course. The implication number one is, um, if the claim is confirmed, it is very unlikely that the remaining 51 sources in the slow sample at redshift higher than 6 are not magnified. In particular, in this plot, you see on the horizontal axis the magnification factor. On the vertical axis, we plotted the probability that uh, all the remaining sources in the same sample are uh, all of them at a magnification factor lower than a given value. For instance, the probability that all the remaining 50 source, 51 sources have all magnification factor lower than 10, it's basically zero, it's 10 to the minus four, so it's very, very unlikely. Even more interestingly, uh, the probability that all the remaining 51 sources have magnification factor lower than 100 is about 40%, so there is a reasonable chance that at least another one is extremely magnified in the same uh, source. And the last implication that I want to discuss about is that it's sufficient that 25% of the remaining uh, sources, so about 12 in actual number, are lensed for the intrinsic luminosity function to differ significantly from the observed uh, one. In particular, this is the luminosity function that is the best fit from uh, Jiang, and uh, this is the luminosity function that we compute, assuming that uh, a random number of 20 sources out of 51 of the remaining are magnified with a, a random magnification factor taken from our distribution. As you can see, we expect, of course, a lower number of uh, bright sources, and these sources are shifted at, fa at the fainter end that increases. So just to sum up, um, we said that we might be missing a large fraction, a large number of phantom quasars, and this could be due to the misclassification from quasar lensing criterion, the selection criterion, or the separation between images is unresolved. I also draw your attention to the hypothesis that the most massive high redshift quasar is extremely lensed, and Avi told us the update that the paper was accepted. And uh, if the hypothesis is true, it is almost certain that the more lensed quasars are present in the same sample, and it's possible that the intrinsic luminosity function could differ significantly, so at a three sigma level, from the observed one. Thank you. Okay, great talk. Is there any extra question? Yeah, please, go ahead. So, um, if you don't need the black holes to grow nearly as much from their seed masses, does that, um, does that make the, like, the direct collapse black holes still necessary, or can you get away with just having pop three stars? Uh, well, so let's say, let's say that this is magnified by a factor 450, that quasar. If it's actually magnified by a factor 450, it means that uh, the mass should be uh, below, I think, below uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses. So it's, uh, yes, it's about factor 20. Yeah, so about, about just um, 9 in 10 to the 8 solar masses, which at this redshift, at redshift 6.3, is very, very, still very challenging to achieve. So with a pop 3 star, so I did this calculation actually for this paper, with a pop 3 star, so with uh, 10 to the 3 solar masses seeded at redshift uh, 25, I think, something like that, you would need to start um, with a minimum mass of 3,000 
solar masses actually in order to reach uh, the, 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 the corrected mass of uh, this quasar, so 9 in 10 to the 8, by that redshift, accreting constantly at the Eddington rate. So you need a minimum mass of 3,000, meaning that it's possible maybe to form a pop 3 star remnant at 3,000 uh, at redshift 25, but it's still very challenging to, for it to grow constantly at the Eddington rate. So we still need maybe direct collapse the codes, and I'm happy about that. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker. And now we should quickly switch the second one. Working. Yeah, yes. yeah, right. <laughs> okay, great. So very quick summary about Martin. Martin actually received his PhD from Oxford University. He works both on mathematics and also actually philosophy as a BHI. He moved in the BHI very recently. He works on geometric analysis, mathematical general relativity, and also black hole formation. So with this great honor, let's just hear what he would tell us today. Well, okay. thank you very much for the invitation. It's very, uh, uh, it's a lovely opportunity to be uh, sharing things with uh, astrophysicists. Um, I will try to give you uh, my <coughs> my feeling for what the big problems are in mathematical general relativity. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful subject. In many ways, it's a, a branch of mathematics, but in many ways, it's uh, different in, in flavor. Some of the big conjectures are different in flavor from some of the classic ones, the beautiful big conjectures of mathematics, whether they can sound prime numbers or geometry, topology, etc. cetera. Um, so the point, the point of the talk is really just to give you uh, a flavor of what mathematicians do when they study general relativity. So uh, I titled the talk, The Big Four Conjectures, uh, I was thinking of uh, animals in the, you know, the, you go on safari to the big five, did you see the big five? And so I, I was thinking uh, maybe I'd, I'd try something like this. So I, I started with the big four, but then I, in, in time I realized actually there's big six. <laughs> so, so just, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if that makes the remembering a little bit more, more annoying. So, I mean, th there'll be some points in the next, uh, say, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, however much time I, I have, where uh, I'm going to just write down some details, some equations, just so that you can believe me when I say that I'm a mathematician. Otherwise, I'm just talking to you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, <laughs> right. But so, uh, and another thing is, I, I really want to, for, for you know, any, any member of the audience to interject and say, no, what does this mean? Or, or or what does this mean that this so you know if, if you have any kind of question or anything like that just shout out uh, you know this, this so okay so the the first two minutes will be a little terse um, so everything takes place in the context of uh, Lorentzian manifold so this is always m plus one dimensional um, g bar uh, is going to satisfy the Einstein equations which uh, I write like this Do you have a darker color pen? Yes. Yes, that was exactly, you know, this little bit, sorry. Um, I'm in the second row and I can't see it. You, okay, okay, so I'll write now with black, so uh, ho hopefully this should be. It still won't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Relax, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, this Lorentzian manifold, which I'm gonna I'm gonna rewrite, right, is is kind of the background structure. It's space time. It's the thing in which everything happens. Fine, and a system of equations called the gauss kadatsi equations tell you that when you embed, right, in uh, a space time, there are certain constraints that you have to satisfy. So when I look at this now, I'm gonna call it MGK. 
Um, now, MGK will be, uh, for all intents and purposes, what I'll be talking about and what I'm interested in. Uh, so MGK will be some, some hypersurface embedded in a space-time. So this will have some uh, normal vector that is a time-like vector. So the light cone, say, at every point looks like this. Right? And so I'm, I'm embedding in a space-time, and in virtue of these equations, uh, it must be the case that the initial data set here satisfies the so-called constraint equations. So this plus this means that um, the following is true. Right now this is the scalar curvature of G. And you might wonder, why on earth are you writing these down? What are we going to do with them in the course of the next 20 minutes, um, or thereabouts? Well, the reason is that um, I, I want to split up the Einstein equations, which you're mostly familiar with in this language, and I want to split the, them up in their 3 plus 1 language. So this is essentially like the, the ADM decomposition that they do from numerical relativity, right? You're doing like the 3 plus 1, you're foliating the, and yeah. then you're yeah. stacking them on top of one another? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it, it, there's some more things to say about this, but essentially, yeah, for all intents and purposes, you can think of this as a 3 plus 1 uh, Hamiltonian viewpoint, if you like. Yeah. So why, why am I doing this? Because the, the 3 plus 1 um, <coughs> split of the Einstein equations will permit me to phrase the following kinds of problems. Suppose I want to form a black hole. Fine. Suppose I want to say something like the following. If a black hole forms, it will produce a space-time with features that are reminiscent or asymptotic or similar to the model solutions. The model solutions being Schwarzschild or K. Why is this interesting? Well, because uh, Everything we, 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 we do, everything we, we think about in GR to some extent is, are based on the model solutions. When we think of the event horizon, when we think of uh, asymptotic infinity, when we think of the ADM mass of a, of, a, of a system, we think of the model solutions. And so when we, when we try to simulate mathematically gravitational collapse, we do so by splitting it into a 3 plus 1 form Finding some triple MGK which satisfies the constraint equations, that's both necessary and sufficient for this to count as an initial data set for the Einstein equations. And then, so this is the, the kind of elliptic part of the equations, or the static part. And then once we have this, we are going to evolve the initial data set using the hyperbolic part of the, of the equation. So in these equations, I'm only, I'm only incorporating a subset of the equations in, in this system. The rest of this system that's not covered by this system is the evolutionary part, and that's what I'm going to use to evolve the data set. And what, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to evolve the data set. That's much easier said than done, by the way. It's, it's still an open problem as how to do that. Um, in full generality, and when I evolve this data set, then I'm going to have a full space-time, so rather than having just one slice, I'm going to have the full guy, and then I'm going to look at the full guy and say, well, does it sit with my intuitions? Does it, does it uh, reproduce the intuitions that I might have had for what happens? Okay, so far all this is a, a little uh, mumbo-jumbo. Now I want to actually show you what the conjectures are and why they're interesting and their physical relevance and where we are at, at this stage in trying to prove them. So as I said, I, I wanted to talk about four conjectures, but now I'm going to talk about six. I'm sorry about that. Um, and the reason that I'm going to do this is because, you see, one, one thing that's particularly interesting about the field of mathematical general relativity is that unlike some other branches of mathematics, say number theory, where some conjectures, for instance, the twin prime conjecture, there are infinitely many pairs of primes that are twin, so that, that differ by two. Um, that, that's a very clearly stated uh, statement, and it may be true or false. 
Now, it's, it's the nature of mathematical general relativity that conjectures aren't exactly of this form. And, and that's going to be my, my challenge today, is try to convey to you the, the, the kind of flavor of how these conjectures, how they're formulated. And essentially, in short, the way they're formulated isn't to say, if A, then B, but rather it's to say, choose a certain initial data set belonging to a certain class, and choose this class in a certain kind of way, then the evolution of these initial data sets will be of a following form. And in particular, they'll reproduce the, the main features of the model solutions. So what are the big six? The big six are kind of, they all have nice names, I think, most of them. One is called weak cosmic censorship. Right. I'll state, I'll explain what these mean. One is called strong cosmic censorship. One is called black hole stability. The other is called black hole rigidity. Now, I want to give you a, a, a flavor of, of how the field is going. The way that things have been, have been going is that people have been, these conjectures aren't proven, but the way that people are trying to make progress on it is typical in mathematics. You, you derive from some combination of this some further conjectures, and then some further conjectures, and then some further conjectures, and then you try to find a test for this conjecture all the way down the line here. If this is false, something must have screwed up somewhere here. <laughs> That's how we do things. So, weak cosmic censorship plus stability plus rigidity gives you what's called the final state conjecture. It's a rather, rather grand name. Uh, in, in fact, I'll describe what that means. It's not, the, the meaning of this conjecture isn't quite as grand as the name suggests. But, but anyway, from the final state conjecture, well, there's another conjecture you can, you can try to, to say. It's called the Penrose inequality. So I'll, I'll also be speaking uh, at the lunch. And by the way, I'll just advertise what you'll be hearing for those that will stay at the lunch. Um, with Professor Yao, uh, we've been able to prove something new about this first time there's been a, a proof in the space-time case, so I'll describe what, what that result is just in basic detail in the lunch. But, but so this is the map of mathematical general relativity. You have these kind of loose conjectures, you don't know if they're true, but you try and combine them to this further conjecture and then a further conjecture, and as I said, if you try to show that this is wrong, then something must be going wrong here. Now, another point, which is very kind of highly non-trivial, is that there is a, a loop here, a very important loop, black hole stability related to strong cosmic censorship. And this loop is what I want to talk about. And hopefully, this is where the physical relevance aspect of all of these things will be most, most uh, felt, most, most, uh, most clear. So le let me just say a few words about what these conjectures are. So first of all, let's start with weak cosmic censorship. Weak cosmic censorship is the claim that if you have an initial data set, you let it evolve by the Einstein equation, then there may be gravitational collapse, there may not be. But whatever happens, whatever happens, whatever space time you produce, it's of the kind that's predictable asymptotically. Okay. Now we have to unpack that statement a little bit. So I will draw the Schwarzschild solution, or its, ma its maximal analytic extension. And I will denote this. This is the event horizon, and this is the asymptotic infinity. Right? Asymptotic infinity. So this is scry. This is spatial infinity. Right? This is asymptotically flat, so when I, this is, remember, this is a space-time, this is inside the black hole, so this is the black hole region. Um, this is a Cauchy surface, an initial data set, and as I go further along in this direction, what I'm actually looking at is 
some asymptotically flat initial data set where perhaps there's some curvature here, some gravitational well, but as I go further out, bigger and bigger radius, the geometry here, in a very precise way, is approaching the Euclidean geometry, namely the flat metric on R3. So, weak cosmic censorship is the statement that, okay, forget about everything here, just consider something like of, of, th of this kind. So just take this guy, zoom it up, it's going to look like something like this, and this is spatial infinity. So I'm going to denote it r equals infinity here. This is initial data set. It's going to satisfy the constraint equations, which I rubbed off a while ago. And by the rest of the Einstein equations, I'm going to evolve this and see what happens. And when I do that, the claim of weak cosmic censorship is that, is that whatever you do, you will always produce an asymptotic infinity, so a region like scry here, which moreover has a past light cone such that this whole region can be foliated by these Cauchy surfaces. Why is that interesting? Because it makes the space-time predictable. It makes the PDEs well-defined from, from an evolutionary standpoint. So that's weak cosmic censorship. So in other words, physically you could say that it means that if gravitational collapse happens, whatever weird physics happens inside the black hole, things outside the black hole are, in, are, are insensitive and remain predictable as, say, Newtonian physics. Are you so, vacuum outside? Or? Right, so in all of these cases, in all of these cases, I can always consider whether or not the Einstein equations are written with a stress-energy tensor on the right-hand side, which is zero or not. And in all of these cases, I can also consider what happens when the cosmological constant is added to the equations or not, and whether it's a positive one or a negative one. And in fact, when I go on to talk about this in maybe three, five minutes, I, I will note something very interesting that happens when lambda is positive, uh, which, as, as we all know, is something that we, that we believe to some extent. Um, and and there will be something non, highly non-trivial happening in, in, with regards to these two things when lambda is positive. So anyway, that's weak cosmic censorship. Strong cosmic censorship is is the statement, it's, it's stronger than weak, but it's not in fact, it doesn't imply weak, so that you might say, well, this was a poor choice of words. I would agree with you to some extent. Strong cosmic censorship is the, is, the, is the claim that whatever this evolution happens, like however this evolution happens, whatever it does, it produces a space-time which is fully globally hyperbolic. So not only is it nice out here, it's also nice in here, inside the black hole. Uh, and the way to see... The way to see this, so I'm going to rub out these arrows, the way to, to see this is that if I now draw, this was the model solution for Schwarzschild, but if I now draw the Kerr, maximal analytic extension of Kerr, well my angles are a little wrong in this, uh, in this picture, please forgive me. Um, but essentially, this is one asymptotic region. Right, that's akin to this model solution. Now, in the Schwarzschild solution, the singularities in the black hole stop anything from going beyond them, and there's a, there's a blow up here in the curvature, and, and all kinds of things get crushed, etc., etc. But in the Kerr case, you can actually extend the space time. So you, you've got the future evolution of this guy. It's, this region is the region determined by the future evolution of this initial data set. This is still spatial infinity. This is still scry. The event horizon is now this line, so I'm going to just denote it event horizon. This is asymptotic infinity, so I'll put that here. Um, and then this is what's called the Cauchy horizon. And this is basically the, the Ligon event horizon. It's an invisible boundary in the space time. And it delineates the boundary beyond which the space time here is no longer fully determined by the initial data set. So in other words, uh, it's not deterministic. So you start with initial conditions, you have an evolutionary equation, you'd hope that you'd be able to know what happens in the future. Sorry, guys, that doesn't happen in Kerr. So, um, so the statement of strong cosmic censorship is that this diagram is only true for the model solution. It's not, in fact, generic. So this doesn't happen in realistic gravitational collapse. This strange non-deterministic feature of Kerr 
is a remnant of the symmetry. That's what strong cosmic censorship is about. So weak cosmic censorship is saying things are good outside the black hole. Strong cosmic censorship is things are good inside the black hole as well. Black hole stability, you can imagine what this means. Black hole stability is not too, not too hard to, to pose. I think it's much a harder job for me to explain weak and strong, but um, black hole stability is, is rather straightforward, right? It's, what does it say? It says that take an initial data set that already contains some, some trapped surface, for instance, or some beginnings of an event horizon. Evolve that data set, but suppose you, you just perturb that data set. So uh, uh, this is my perturbation. Okay, just have a perturbation to, to the initial data. And then the claim is, well, for sufficiently small perturbations, the evolution of this initial data will still resemble the, uh, the model solution. In other words, if I perturb the black hole a little bit, it stays a black hole, and moreover, the geometry of the black hole is still asymptotic to the model solution. Black hole stability. That kind of makes sense. This thing I'll get to at the end of the talk, it's a very nice one, and I think it's actually relevant in, in, in astrophysics and, and all these kind of things, so I want to talk this in a, a little while. But now let's just talk about bl black hole rigidity. So, so black hole rigidity is, is, uh, is what physicists discovered to some extent in very specialized circumstances and called the no-hair theorems, which I, I, I'm sure you've heard of before. The no-hair theorems tell you that if you're a solution to the vacuum Einstein, or perhaps the Einstein-Maxwell system, and that a certain things are true of your space-time. So I could list a few, but there, there are a few, and some of them are not so interesting to go through. But for instance, you're stationary, i.e. there's no gravitational radiation. There's no perturbation. You're stationary. There's a killing field, etc., etc. You're axisymmetric, say. You have a rotation symmetry. You're not just stationary in time, you're also you're also, in a, in a sense, you're also symmetric in space. You have a connected horizon, so you don't have two black holes, say. Well, you add these conditions one by one, and then the proof, the conclusion of these theorems is to say, well, if all the following are true, then you have to be a model solution. You have to be a Schwarzschild. You have to be a Kerr. So the no-hair theorems, it was, it was said to no-hair because the idea was that the black holes don't have traces or signatures beyond the model solutions. But this is only true if they're stationary, vacuum, etc., etc., etc. And even so, the mathematicians got a hold of what the physicists did and suddenly didn't like it very much because, of course, they saw the proofs of the physicists. The proofs weren't too bad, but the assumptions of the physicists somewhat trivialized the theory. So, for instance, Hawking assumed that something's analytic Okay, I mean, if you assume something's analytic, you don't have to prove anything anymore because the thing, you know everything from, from the start. So, so mathematicians don't really like the physicist's treatment of no hair, and so they've called it rigidity. They don't say no hair. You say no hair to a math conference, they all, they all walk away. <laughs> right? you, better say, you better use the word rigidity and not no hair when you talk about this kind of thing in mathematics. Do you accept the proof of uh, stability, for example, from LIGO? If LIGO collides black holes and sees that they're stable, is that good enough for mathematics? No. <laughs> but, but I want to come back to this comment. I think it's very interesting, and, and, and I'm not going to go talk more too much about rigidity. So what I want to talk about now, so, so I mean, the basic picture is that, that, I mean, the one thing I should say is that also, you know, for the, for, you know, for the sake of the, next, uh, of the next talk in the luncheon, that if you combine weak cosmic censorship, black hole stability, and black hole rigidity, then you have what's called the final state conjecture. I rubbed out the arrows, but they were there when I drew them. And the final state conjecture essentially tells you what you think it tells you, is that if you have collapse, basically you get a Kerr, or you get a Kerr Newman, or you get a Schwarzschild, basically. The final state, meaning that whatever initial state you start with, it all gets radiated away, it all disappears, the traces of what you had disappear, and all you get in the end is something that's like Kerr. Final state. And then, if the final state conjecture is true, then you can you can try to argue that this should be true, which is a geometric inequality now that relates the ADM mass with the area of the event horizon. And this is a much more doable conjecture because this is actually a precise inequality you can test. The way you test these conjectures, the way you prove them, apart from rigidity, which uh, has a, there's a, 
a well-defined statement that you could put forward. The way you prove this is you consider some open set of initial data, by which I mean you consider a, 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 a range of initial data lying within some class. And you do the evolution for each one, right? And then you say, okay, well, the features that I wanted to, to hold true, namely the things don't be hyperbolic, or the thing doesn't have this weird stuff inside, or whatever conjecture you try to prove, is true for each of the members of the open set that you started with. So you have to design and fashion some open set of initial data, some range, if you like, a range of parameters, a range of perturbations. And as you can expect, if you screw with the perturbations and you make them bad, 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 well then mm, you might destroy the conjecture. So in this sense, it's not like number theory where you're trying to say, okay, there are infinitely many twin primes. That's a very well precise thing, well defined precise thing. These ones, it's, you have to engineer the starting conditions, but make them sufficiently general that the, that the conjecture still has some meaning. So you can imagine that what you're really doing is actually you're finding, you're finding the sufficient conditions that allow you to prove the, the statement in the conclusion, and you're trying to generalize this class little by little by little by little until you find a counterexample where you screwed up too much with the perturbation and something screwed up, and then you're outside of the class for which these conjectures hold true. So that's the flavor of it. It's not really like number theory. It's more like generalize the class for which this is true. Generalize, generalize that, until you hit a counterexample. Okay, so in the last two minutes, I just want to say something which, which I hope will uh, be of interest to, to, to some people, and this is relevant to LIGO. So there's something amazing that happens, which is kind of remarkable, um, and it's the, it's the following thing, that when you have, I'll try to be very quick here, because I know we have a, have a deadline. So this is the Cauchy horizon, and this is Scry, and this is the initial data set. Okay. So there's a, there's a thing that happens, and this is, this is the beautiful thing. There's a thing that happens that when you perturb the initial data set here, all right, then waves are going to go everywhere, right? You're going to get gravitational waves going everywhere. And what happens is that when they go inside the black hole, they get screwed up. They get screwed up, things start to mesh together, things start to focus, things start to get more and more intense, the geometry starts to curve, to curve, to curve, to curve. And then, basically, you can have on approach, as these waves travel in and they interact non-linearly and do all kinds of crap, you start to get a blow-up. The space-time becomes no longer defined, things diverge. But that's good, because that means that the space-time becomes singular, it becomes screwed up, the curvature blows up, and you cannot extend beyond the Cauchy horizon, which was previously there in Kerr, and therefore you don't have the loss of determinism that Einstein would have been so sad to see in his beautiful theories. So the, the reason I'm saying this is that stability of the exterior, the more stable this guy is in the exterior, the nicer the stability is in the interior, the less likely they are to non-linearly interact and blow up, the less likely they are to cut off the space-time, and the more likely you're going to fail determinism. And what is the beautiful thing? When lambda is positive, when lambda is positive, the stability here is very good. Big smiley face. Very, very stable black holes. Very stable black holes. But wait a minute. That's terrifying. What happens if you have a stable black hole? Well, the interior is stable. Okay. What happens if the interior is stable? Well, you have a Cauchy horizon. What is that? You have a loss of determinism. Einstein does not play dice, perhaps not, but his theory is not deterministic. And so, in lambda positive, general relativity is not deterministic. That's the kind of most up-to-date, beautiful thing that people have, have figured out. And the relevance to LIGO is that if we can observe the, the decay of the perturbations of the black hole geometry, and we can see that it's similar to what we actually compute and do when we do the lambda positive case of black hole stability, then we have indirect evidence for the interior stability of the black hole and the Cauchy horizon and the non-determinism of Einstein equation. So anyway, that's the, that's the talk. Thank you for listening.
the quantum mechanics. And so we shouldn't be, Einstein should be, shouldn't have been too depressed by, by this outcome because it, it, we, we know that theory needs to be replaced and, and the corrections will appear just when the curvature gets to the planck scale. Or, so it should, it's nothing to worry about. Um, so so here's, here's the thing that's worrying. The curvatures and the... So, okay, so the, the, the scale at which the Cauchy horizon is, the scale of things, the size of spheres, if you look at the geometry, etc., is not small. No, it doesn't. It, the curvature goes to the flat the, the, the curvature here is not small. This curvature, in the original curve diagram, the curvature of the Cauchy horizon is not particularly small. Nothing like in Schwarzschild, where on approach of the singularity, it starts to, it starts to blow up. So this is saying that if the Cauchy horizon is stable, there's no blow up, then the loss of determinism happens at a scale much higher than when the scale that you're talking about, where the corrections are going to come in. But it's still inside the Cauchy horizon, right? Yeah. The, the, so then how would I, I don't understand how it would propagate outwards to influence the, I guess, black hole. No, it would not affect anything else, but Einstein's theory is intrinsically inconsistent. That's, yeah. but, but the question, you are saying quantum corrections will not come into play? Uh, at the not, not at these scales. They will come into play for sure in the Schwarzschild diagram at the scales when you approach the singularity. And uh, they will, I, I mean, my expectation, but very naive, is that they will come into play at some point. But if the, if the Cauchy horizon is stable here, the scales are so nice and non-quantum mechanical that the indeterminism of Einstein happens way before anything quantum mechanical might save the day or correct the theory, etc., etc. Well, we yeah, it seems we have an interesting. Well, yeah, I guess you can say it like that. Yeah. Wait, does that? Am I missing? Maybe I misunderstood what you said earlier. Does that though then break strong cosmic censorship? Yes. Now, oh. Okay, that was the point. Yeah, so in lambda positive, strong cosmic censorship is now highly in doubt. People are starting to not believe it. Do you strictly need lambda positive, or do you just need some universe where background perturbations like gravitational waves are permeating anyway? Well, I mean, that's a good question, but, but the setting, but maybe you're asking for a little too much. I mean, the setting we do is asymptotically flat, and then we do asymptotically positive lambda, and even in that case, we struggle to do anything more than than, than that. So we can't model a universe where the thing that what you're saying is true. I mean, all, all we can do is just say, okay, what happens when lambda is zero? What happens when lambda is positive? And then we study those cases. Okay. But, but in theory, yes. If you had a universe that somehow absorbed, you know, if there was a bin that took all the radiation and makes the exterior so stable, irregardless, I mean, irrespective of lambda, then this thing would be stable. Then you could pass through the horizon. Then you have a problem with determinism. So yeah, any universe in which there's a, a bin absorbing radiation is going to screw up your determinism inside the black hole. And how much we should be close to the center to be actually to break the you know cosmic censorship? How what is what do you mean? How close to the center? I'm just saying also because you also said that if you are weak, you should be outside. Actually. Oh, so strong is all inside the black hole. Okay, so it doesn't affect. Outside. It affects nothing. The exterior could be perfectly well deterministic. Okay. So for all intents and intents and purposes, and for all of us, and for all kind of astrophysics where you're measuring things outside the black hole, and you, you know, everything's fine. But it's just that what's inside the black hole is no longer determined by the conditions outside. And you are sure that it doesn't propagate outside at all? Because no, it doesn't propagate. It doesn't propagate, about. right? It doesn't propagate. It's okay. inside the black hole. It's already passed inside the black hole. Everything out here is perfectly fine and deterministic. And pretty cool. Cool. But so then we leave it for you guys to figure out inside. <laughs> I was just going to ask, if I, is that arrow bijective though? So if I screw with strong cosmic censorship, do I then screw with black hole stability on the other side? Or is it just... No. Okay. That's a very good question. No. So it's a funny case. It's a funny one. Strong cosmic censorship is really only about the interior. Mm -hmm. And so all of these could be very, very true. And strong cosmic censorship could be false. It's just that this arrow is in this direction. But this arrow is not in this direction. So it's not bijective. I'm sorry, we're going to have to wrap up. For oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, but we can continue later. <laughs> okay, thank you so much.